The Curious Case of Joseph Merrick, known as the Elephant Man. You may have heard of the Elephant Man before, but likely don't know much about his story. This is the strange and tragic history of Joseph Merrick. Joseph Merrick was born on August 5, 1862 in Leicester, England. By all accounts, he was a perfectly healthy baby, showing no signs of any abnormalities at birth. There are conflicting reports on exactly when Joseph's drastic physical deformities began to manifest. However, most agree they did not become extremely severe until around the age of five. Still, Joseph was affected from an early age. As early as 21 months old, he started developing noticeable swelling of his lips. This was followed by a bony protrusion on his forehead that later grew to resemble an elephant's trunk. Joseph and his mother Mary shared an extremely close bond in his early years. Mary's life was also marked by tragedies besides Joseph. She bore three other children, but two sadly died very young. When Joseph was just 11 years old, Mary passed away from pneumonia. As one would expect, her death devastated the young boy. At this point, Joseph's deformities were quite severe, and his mother had been his closest friend and confidant. After Mary's passing, Joseph's father, also named Joseph, remarried a very strict widow named Emma Woodentill. Showing little sympathy for his condition, Emma demanded that Joseph leave school and earn money for the household, despite his physical abnormalities severely limiting his job prospects. Against the odds, Joseph managed to find work at a cigar shop, but his expanding right hand soon became too large and clumsy to properly roll cigars. Though Emma still expected him to financially contribute, his father secured a hawker's license allowing Joseph to sell gloves door to door. However, potential customers were too frightened by his appearance, making this venture short-lived as well. The tragic hand life had dealt Joseph continued to worsen after his mother's early death. Though he persevered for some time, his worsening physical form made earning a livelihood nearly impossible. Unable to make any sales due to his appearance, Joseph faced cruel mistreatment at home. His father would beat him for coming home empty-handed, while his stepmother Emma denied him meals unless he earned the money to pay for them. At 17, Joseph left to stay with his uncle Charles Merrick, but finding stable employment remained beyond reach. Soon after, his peddling license was fully revoked, accused of somehow terrorizing the community just by trying to earn a humble living. With no other options, Joseph entered the Leicester Workhouse System, an institution housing and employing those unable to support themselves. The workhouses were notorious for appalling conditions, but even that was sadly nothing new for the long-suffering teen. After five years in the workhouse system, Joseph contacted a music hall showman named Sam Tor, wondering if people would pay to gawk at his disfigurements. Contrary to dramatic depictions, Joseph himself sought out this dehumanizing line of work, realizing exhibition as an oddity was his only chance of financial independence given his condition through no fault of his own. Seeing profit potential, Sam Tor organized a group of managers to showcase Joseph as a sideshow attraction. This team devised the name The Elephant Man and traveled around England's East Midlands region, including Joseph's hometown Leicester. Though the exhibition under tour provided stable income, Joseph endured deplorable exploitation for the remainder of his short life. His contact with showman Sam Tour was driven by necessity rather than greed or deception. Joseph's managers then brought him to London, contacting a seasoned showman named Tom Norman who ran Penny Gaff novelty shops in the city's East End. Penny Gaffs exhibited human oddities for paying customers, mostly the lower class. Despite never meeting Joseph in person, Norman agreed to take over managing and showcasing him. In November, Joseph traveled with manager George Hitchcock to London to begin this next venture as an exhibited spectacle. Upon first seeing Joseph's extreme disfigurements, Norman worried they could actually prove too horrifying for success as a novelty. But he proceeded with plans to display the elephant man in the back room of a shop on Whitechapel Road. Hitchcock's posters and pamphlets played up Joseph's half-man, half-elephant billing. The exhibition did decent business, with most profits coming from pamphlet sales to visitors hoping to learn Joseph's background. Though not an outright smash, Joseph was apparently able to save some earnings, hoping to one day buy a home of his own and escape perpetual exploitation. Importantly, Joseph's Whitechapel Road venue sat directly across from the prestigious London Hospital. This brought many medical students and doctors to gawk at him as a sort of medical specimen. One such visitor was Reginald Tuckett, a young surgeon who was intrigued enough to tell his senior colleague Frederick Travis about this extraordinary case. Travis would soon play a pivotal role in Joseph's life, 
So while still dehumanized as a spectacle in London, Joseph's condition also brought him to the attention of prominent medical men, including Dr. Travis who took a profound personal interest in his care. Senior London Hospital Surgeon Frederick Travis arranged a private viewing with Joseph. He would later admit his first reaction was disgust at what seemed the most degraded human being I had ever seen. But Travis' curiosity was not yet satisfied. He had his younger colleague Reginald Tuckett ask Joseph if he would come to the hospital for examination. Joseph agreed, wearing a cloak and mask to hide his appearance even for the short trip there. Upon conducting measurements and tests, Travis made the following observations about Joseph Merrick's extraordinary condition. His head circumference measured an alarming 36 inches around. His right wrist was 12 inches in circumference. One swollen finger was 5 inches in diameter. Warty skin growths covered his body, some with an unpleasant odor. Sections of skin sagged and hung loosely off his frame. Severe bone deformities affected his right arm, both legs, and oversized skull. So while initially repulsed, Travis' medical curiosity compelled him to carefully examine Joseph and better understand the extent of his bizarre disfigurements. His detailed notes and measurements documented the anomaly that was the elephant man. Even with compassionate medical attention, Joseph still needed to hide behind a mask and cloak just to walk London streets without causing a disruptive scene or endangering his safety. The degree of his physical affliction was simply that extreme. In contrast to his extreme disfigurements, exam notes specified Joseph's left arm and hand appeared perfectly normal and functional. His genitals were also documented as normal. Aside from the deformities, Travis concluded Merrick seemed in good general health. After allowing intimate examinations several times, Joseph eventually put a stop to it. He said it made him feel stripped naked like an animal at market. At the same time, public tastes were shifting against freak show exploits like the Elephant Man in Victorian England. Such crude exhibitions increasingly faced criticism as indecent. Shortly after Merrick's last hospital visit, police closed down Tom Norman's shop displaying human oddities. Joseph's Lester managers also withdrew him from Norman's venue. Now out of work, Joseph traveled continental Europe with a sideshow operator named Sam Roper. But anti-freak sentiment was spreading, and the venture struggled badly. After failed tours, Joseph returned to London penniless and homeless, his already tragic situation now desperate. Though examinations at London Hospital had been dehumanizing, Dr. Frederick Travis took a personal interest in Joseph's welfare. With no place left to go, Joseph's dire plight was brought to Travis' attention. So while still stripped of dignity as a spectacle, Joseph's case forged an important medical ally in Dr. Travis. This bond would finally offer him a stable situation and chance for more normal life during his final years. With nowhere else to go in London long term, Joseph was left approaching strangers for help. But his severe speech impediments and disturbing appearance only frightened people. At one point, police had to intervene when a harassing crowd surrounded Joseph in public. An officer brought the sick and exhausted man to an empty waiting area to evade the abusive gawkers. Unable to comprehend Joseph's attempted explanations, police finally used a calling card he carried to contact Dr. Travis about his dire situation. Recognizing Joseph, Travis brought him by cab to the London hospital. He was admitted for bronchitis washed, fed, and given a small attic room to rest. After causing some controversy over his permanent care arrangements, public donations and concern for Joseph's well-being helped influence the decision to have him remain at the London hospital for the rest of his days under Travis' supervision. So in the end, after a life of unimaginable exploitation, it was compassion that offered Joseph his only true reprieve. The hospital bed granted by Dr. Travis finally provided him the dignity and stability missing during his decades as a dehumanized spectacle on the streets. Joseph was moved from the attic into two ground floor rooms with an adjoining courtyard. Travis adapted the quarters with specialized furniture catered to Joseph's condition, including a custom bed with no mirrors per doctor's orders. Under Travis' attentive care, Joseph's life greatly improved at the hospital. Travis took time deciphering his speech, finally allowing real conversation with the patient he considered a friend. He visited Joseph daily, spending hours with him every Sunday. Perhaps most importantly, Travis realized Joseph had been isolated from women his whole life due to his disturbing appearance. Hoping to provide some normal human connection, Travis arranged for a female friend named Layla Matron to meet Joseph. She agreed after warning about his extreme condition. Though brief, for Joseph those moments with Matron left a profound impact. He told Travis she was the first woman to ever smile at or shake his hand simple human kindnesses he had never before received from the fairer gender. 
So thanks to Travis, Joseph's final years were filled with compassion he had never known during decades earning his living as a despised spectacle. The good doctor not only tended to his medical needs, but his basic emotional needs as a fellow human. Layla Matron maintained a pen pal friendship with Joseph those last years. Travis believed Joseph harbored hopes of living in a blind institution one day, finally finding a woman able to see past his surface deformities. Unfortunately, over four years at the hospital, Joseph's condition gradually declined. His worsening disabilities and dangerously enlarging head required constant nursing care, mostly bedridden. On April 11, 1890, at the age of 27, Joseph Merrick was discovered dead in his room lying across his bed at an odd angle. Due to his massive skull, he had to sleep propped upright on his knees. Travis hypothesized Joseph had simply tried lying down to sleep normally like any other person, accidentally dislocating his neck in the process. Even at autopsy, accomplished Dr. Travis remained puzzled by the exact nature of the rare affliction that had stolen so much from Joseph Merrick. Though treated with dignity in his final years at the hospital, Joseph's life remained tragically cut short by the mysterious medical anomalies beyond his control since birth. Despite the brevity of his life spent in social exile, Joseph left an inspiring legacy of perseverance and humanity. Though cruelly cast as a horror spectacle, he never let his spirit become monstrous only seeking connection and normalcy against all odds.